But I'm kind of starting a trend here, at least I'm trying to whenever I have to fill in for someone who's absent. And that's kind of the theme of the birth of modern science. And really it's not only what our ideas are, but also where our ideas came from. And kind of tying this in, I'm titling tonight's talk, The Birth of Modern Science, Watershed. And if you remember my talk from last month, we basically covered the period of events that started from antiquity all the way up to Copernicus. And I kind of tied it into what we've been seeing lately with Mars. Mars, of course, just underwent opposition and then retrograde motion. And you can see here an image by uh, Tunk Tuzel in 2010, kind of showing the path that Mars takes when it reaches opposition and, and retrograde motion, meaning for a brief period of time, a couple of months, it goes westward, and then it stops and goes eastward again. And again, if you're you know, thousands of years into the past, if you're seeing this pattern in the night sky, it's literally going to throw you for a loop loop because it's extremely complex and difficult to figure out. And if you're trying to model what's going on in the heavens, you've got to come up with a self-consistent definition of how to model the objects of the night sky, whether it's the sun, the moon, the stars, or in this case, the planets, which are extremely complex. Now, there's basically two approaches to this. Number one is just basically preserve appearances. Number two, get to the underlying physical description. Now, for thousands of years, this was basically the approach. Preserve appearances. Don't worry about why. Don't worry about the underlying physical laws that, des that um, describe the motions of the heavens. Just come up with a model that works. Doesn't necessarily mean it's right, but it has to work. So that's kind of where we've been up until, you know, where I left off last time with Copernicus. Now, to transition from the old world into the new, we're basically going to make a jump from this point to this point right here, which is basically getting to the underlying physical description, the laws that govern the universe and how it works. So tonight we're going to take a step forward in that path. But just kind of a quick review here. You know, going back thousands of years ago, um, the classical period, the classical philosophers of of uh, ancient Greece basically could be summed up with Aristotle, who um, refined the work of Eudoxus, another student of Plato, and came up with an extremely complex system of 55 crystalline spheres within spheres to sort of describe the motions of what we're seeing in the night sky. But he went a step further, and really what Aristotle did is he separated the laws of the heavens from the laws of the earth. So the realm of the earth is the realm of death and decay and rest. If I take an object and throw it, it eventually comes to rest because that's the natural state of things on the earth. The heavens, however, are the state of unceasing motion and perfection. So that was more or less the Aristotelian view of the world. Planetary motions are part of the perfect celestial realm, and there's no need to understand their physical laws because they just are what they are. Uh, mathematics and astronomy were expressions of perfection in and of themselves. You know, the angles of a triangle sum up to 180 degrees because it just is what it is. Same kind of thing with the motions of the heavenly bodies. Physics is separate from mathematics and astronomy, and that has to deal, that physics ultimately deals with the causes of natural phenomenon here on Earth, rest, death, and decay. So that's the Aristotelian view of the world. And again, it's more or less the common sense of view of the world, and we now know today it's wrong. It's 100% wrong, but it stood for thousands of years, and it took a long time for mankind to get away from this. Following up on Aristotle was Ptolemy, and again, to describe the motions, the complex motions of the objects in the night sky, particularly the, the planets, he refined the, um, the concept of the epicycle by introducing the equant, which used uniform angular motion to describe the path that the planets take in the night sky. And this held for nearly 14 centuries. Now again, um, you know, Ptolemy's equant, an epicycle is a circle within a circle. So you have the center of the circle here, the Earth slightly off center, and then a circle within a circle to sort of describe the, um, the loop-de-loop -loop paths that the planets take. As in the night sky. So the problem with this, now it worked. It worked very, very well. If your goal is just to preserve appearances and not necessarily get at the underlying laws that govern the universe, 
This worked very well. If you want to predict when Mars is going to go retrograde, when an object in the night sky is going to appear at a certain place, this model ultimately works. But again, just because it works, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct fundamentally. And it stood for a long time. Very complex. Again, when you put the Earth fixed and unmoving at the center of the universe, which is more or less the common sense view of the universe, because we don't really sense in any way that we're on a moving Earth. We don't see stellar parallax. Um, we can't really, you know, again, we know the answer today. Thousands of years ago, though, the Earth was just seen as being too big to move. You can move a rock, you can move a boulder, but as the boulder gets bigger, it has more Earth in it, which means it's, it's going to be more difficult to move until you get to a mountain, which is impossible to move. And so imagine trying to move the entire Earth. In the mind of Aristotle and the ancient Greek philosophers, the Earth was simply too big to move, so it had to be fixed and unmoving at the center of the universe. Common sense view from our vantage point on Earth. The problem is it's extremely complex to model everything else. And this view of the universe, the Ptolemaic view, ultimately held for the better part of 14 centuries before Nicholas Copernicus came along and changed things a bit. And of course, the reason it held for so long is because of the great interruptions of the medieval period and the classical period. The fall of Rome in the 5th century AD, literally all knowledge ending, and then the fall of the Baghdad Caliphate in the uh, 13th century AD. Uh, you know, Baghdad was the center of the intellectual world for 500 years during the Islamic Golden Age before it was eventually conquered and destroyed. But Copernicus came along at a time when the world was changing. New ideas were being introduced into European civilization. The works of Ptolemy and Aristotle were being rediscovered and translated from classical Syriac back into Latin and Greek, their original languages. People were beginning to rediscover these works, the rise of the great universities, the reformers, and then, of course, the voyages of Christopher Columbus, discovering new lands that were nowhere on the European map at that time. So the Europeans began to ask these questions. Well, if Aristotle and Ptolemy didn't know about these things, then what else didn't they know? Now, Copernicus himself was not a revolutionary. He was not trying to in any way overthrow the old worldview of Aristotle. In fact, he was trying to be Aristotelian in his worldview. He hated the equant introduced by Ptolemy. He wanted to re replace it, basically purify the system by getting back to uniform circular motion, which is an Aristotelian ideal. But in order to do that, he had to revive the heliocentric model of the universe first introduced by Aristarchus of Samos in antiquity, thousands of years earlier. So he placed the sun at the center of the universe and the planets going around the sun. And of course, he waited until his deathbed to publish it because it was an incomplete model and he himself didn't really have enough confidence. I would say he objected to a lot of the things about his model. Um, it also retained epicycles. So, in some ways, it was not necessary. It was more complex than the Ptolemaic view of the universe, which used 40 epicycles as opposed to his, which was 48. But he got rid of the equant. It restored uniform circular motion. And his model of the universe explained retrograde Mars. We now know this pattern in the night sky. If the sun is at the center of the universe, it's basically Earth catching up to Mars, which is further out in the solar system. And that's why you see this pattern in the sky as opposed to a geocentric model by Aristotle and Ptolemy where the Earth is fixed and unmoving and then you have cycles, circles within in circles. So it's just a trivial sense of the Earth being closer to the Sun than Mars and that solves the whole retrograde pattern that we see in the night sky. So now again, Aris, um, Copernicus sort of had one foot in the old world and one foot in the new world. He took a step forward in introducing a new idea. What's the most powerful virus out there? It's an idea. Once it gets supplanted in the mind, it's very, very hard to get rid of an idea. Anybody remember the movie Inception? Leonardo DiCaprio several years ago? Pretty interesting. So this idea of a geocentric model held for 2,500 years Copernicus comes along at the right time, introduces a new idea. It was largely objected to, 
but there were a few people out there that were starting to catch on to this new idea and they started to go forward with a heliocentric model instead of backward to a geocentric model and that's where we start to move forward in the birth of modern science. So again, the Copernican model, you could argue, was only an incremental improvement from the Ptolemaic model, but the idea held because of the timing of it in the early Renaissance period. And when an idea gets out there, eventually it's going to gain traction. So the idea itself was revolutionary, even though Copernicus himself was not a revolutionary. He was actually trying to go back and be Aristotelian in his ideas. Following up from Copernicus, we go to the next generation. And we're going to talk tonight about these two men right here, Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler. And this is really the, the watershed moment in the history of science, what these two men did to sort of move us forward from preserving appearances to the underlying physical laws of the universe. And we'll start with Tycho Brahe. Now, he was born in 1546. Copernicus died in 1543, so he was born three years after Copernicus died. So he really is part of the generation, the next generation that came after Copernicus. He was a Danish nobleman, about as close to a royalty as you can get. In fact, um, I believe it was two of his cousins who were actually characters in one of Shakespeare's plays, Hamlet. So just a little trivia history there. He was a brilliant astronomer and instrument builder, the best of his time when it comes to building instruments for doing naked eye astronomy. Tycho Brahe was the best naked eye astronomer. He came just the era just before the telescope was invented. And he was arguably the best naked eye astronomer of his time and pro probably of all time. And he admired Copernicus as a mathematician. However, he thought Copernicus went too far in placing the Earth as a moving planet around the sun. He didn't like that idea. So he was actually struggling with that and trying to go backwards a little bit. But the model itself and the mathematics behind the model, he admired that aspect of, of uh, Nicholas Copernicus. Now, uh, he was arguably the best mathematician of his day and um, had a little incident when he was in school. He, um, got into a discussion with uh, one of his classmates in college about who was the better mathematician. In fact, it was actually his third cousins. Words were exchanged, and then somebody said something about somebody's mother, so they drew swords, got into a little bit of a sword fight. And so Tico lost his nose and got chopped off in a sword fight. So um, he uh, fashioned a couple of different noses. He had a a wooden nose for everyday use, a silver nose, and then he had a golden nose for when he was in formal meetings and public appearances. So he became known as the man with the golden nose. Kind of sounds like the villain in a James Bond movie. <laughs> so that is uh, part of the legend of, of Tycho Brahe. Now, to really get him started, there was an event that occurred in 1572, and it was a supernova in the constellation Cassiopeia, and you can see a diagram of it here. November of 1572, a young Tycho Brahe observed a new star, brilliant, brighter than all the other stars in the W of Cassiopeia. And um, over the next 16 months, he began to make detailed measurements of this bright new star. Now, at that time, again, from the perspective of the Aristotelian view of the universe, any change in the night sky would have to be in the sublunar realm because the earth is the realm of death and decay and change and the, the, the stars, the celestial sphere, is the, is the realm of perfection and, and unchanging um, perfection. So he made detailed measurements, but he failed to measure something called parallax. If it was in the sublunar realm, that he should be able to measure parallax. Again, the concept of parallax is pretty simple. Place, a, place your finger here, place your thumb here, blink your eyes back and forth, and you'll see that your thumb moves back and forth, and your finger stays relatively fixed. Same concept in the sky. If an object is relatively close to the Earth, then you should see a shift 
um, as the Earth revolves around the Sun. Well, he did not measure any parallax of this new star, and therefore he concluded that it must be beyond the realm of the Moon, further out from the Moon, and part of the celestial realm. Now, if this new star appeared and it was part of the celestial realm instead of the sublunar realm, then that, that's basically a blow to the Aristotelian and Ptolemaic view of the universe because it means that the heavens are not um, the realm of unceasing change. So it was a blow to the Ptolemaic uh, model of the universe. So this really got Tycho going as far as his career in astronomy and some of the, uh, the measurements that he was doing. So the great supernova of 1572 is a clue that um, something was awry, if you will, with the Aristotelian view of the universe. Now, to set up his Tychonic system, again, he didn't like the idea of a moving Earth. So what he did was kind of come up with this weird hybrid of both, the Copernican model and the Ptolemaic model of the universe. Basically, he fixed the Earth fixed and unmoving at the center of the universe, and then had the sun also a center of motion with all the planets going around the sun. So if Mercury and Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn all revolving around the sun, but then the sun and the moon go around the earth. So the planets go around the sun, but the sun and the moon go around the earth. So the earth is fixed and unmoving. You know, it's, it's kind of the situation of I can have my cake and eat it too. I can take care of what I'm seeing in the night sky and, um, you know, preserve appearances, but um, keep the earth fixed and unmoving. So he's one step away from Copernicus, basically went one step backward from where Copernicus was and made the earth fixed and unmoving at the center, but everything else goes around the sun except the moon. That goes around the earth along with the sun. So it's kind of a weird model, and it used epicycles similar to what Copernicus's model used also. Now, here's where Tycho takes a step forward toward the modern world. He believed strongly in his Tychonic system, but he knew that words were not enough. In order for him to firmly root his system in the annals of history, he needed data to back it up. So he set out on a quest to gather hard observational data to prove that his Tychonic system was the correct system of the universe. And that's a step toward modern science. Science is about, basically you have a hypothesis or theory, but then you need data to back up that hypothesis or theory to show that it's correct. Otherwise, it's just a theory. So Tycho was adamant in his quest to show that his observations ultimately proved that his system was right. And that set him on a quest to gather very precise data to back up his Tychonic system. Now, he had the backing of the Danish king at that time, and he moved to an island called Havan, Havain, between Denmark and Sweden, modern Denmark and modern Sweden, and he built something called Uraniburg, which is literally the heavenly castle. And it was an opulent palace, 100% dedicated toward astronomy, and science. And this became the center of, Europe, of the European world in the Renaissance period for studying astronomy. All financed by the Danish king. I mean, you talk about astronomy and luxury, this was it. And he had it all. And he did work there for 20 years, very precise work for 20 years on gathering data on the heavenly bodies, the, the studying the planets, and everything. And this is essentially what he accomplished in his 20 years at Uraniborg. The best instruments that Tycho could design for modern day astronomy at that time were at Uraniborg. And he was able to achieve an unprecedented one to two arc minute precision in his measurements, which is incredible for naked eye astronomy. Again, pre telescopic era. So prior to this, I mean, that's about as close as you can get without any type of magnification instrument if you're just doing naked eye astronomy. So, and that was done at Uraniburg. And it became the premier center for astronomical research in Europe 
at that time. Again, scholars and scientists from all over the world who wanted to be on the cutting edge of astronomy wanted to study with Tycho and be involved in his research at Uraniburg. That's what it essentially was. Similar to modern day Harvard, Harvard, Yale, UC Berkeley. Think of the big glass telescopes that we have today that are used for astronomical research. That's what Uraniburg was at that time. And he also, throughout the 20 years at Uraniburg, was able to catalog the positions of 777 stars. Again, you're just where they are in the night sky and use that as the background for mapping out the motions of the planets. And it was the most precise planetary data ever achieved at that time. So he studied in exquisite detail the path of the planets and cataloged the positions of 777 stars, all with naked eye instruments. It's an incredible feat at that time. There's another event that occurred that also dealt a blow to the Aristotelian and Ptolemaic view of the universe, and that was the Great Comet of 1777, or, or I'm sorry, 1577. And here you can see the sketch from Tycho's notebook regarding this comet that he studied. And he also was able to show that it was further out from, you know, further out than where the moon was. So it was part of the celestial realm. And you're seeing change in the celestial realm, which is anti-Aristotelian. And um, he was also able to show that it was that the sun was the center of the motion because the tail of the comet actually points away from the sun. And in mapping the path that that comet takes, it actually is going around the sun. So the sun was the center of motion. So it was another fatal blow to the geocentric model of the universe. Now, in 1588, while at Uraniburg, he published the second volume of a three volume book, and I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that name, but essentially it means the introduction to the new astronomy. Volume one was incomplete and was not published until after his death in the early 17th century. Volume two was published while he was alive at Uraniburg and volume three was never published. But the third volume included Tycho's observations of the Great Comet of 1577, as well as the details of his geoheliocentric model of the universe. And uh, it was printed while he was at Uraniburg and of course, volume one was uh, published after he died. So his ideas were captured in 1588 in this book while he was at Uraniburg. But here's where things really get interesting and ultimately set the stage for Johannes Kepler. He did detailed observations of the orbital path of Mars and collected 20 years of precise data, the best data in the world at that time on the, on the uh, path of Mars. Over 20 years of Mars oppositions. And again, he was trying to measure parallax for Mars because he wanted to, to ultimately get the distance to Mars as part of his Tychonic model. But he failed to do that, so he kept doing it over and over again. And he could never quite get more than one or two arc minutes of precision. So, but by continuing to do this, he kept on getting better data, 20 years worth of data. And that ultimately set the stage for Kepler to take us to the laws of planetary motion. Now, life happens. In 1588, King Frederick II, who was his royal benefactor, in other words, the person who was paying him to have this island on a vein and the heavenly castle, he died. His son and heir, Christian IV, was only 11 years old, so he was not ready to take the throne yet. So they appointed something called the Regency Council, basically to rule until his son was able to take the throne about a decade later. The head of the council didn't like Tycho Brahe, so his influence with the royalty sort of began to wane around 1588. And finally, when Christian did take the throne in 1596, he and Tycho were not on the same page. He was more interested in war than he was in science. And other things began to come out. Some of Tycho's enemies began to surface and influence the king against him, including his treatment of peasants that weren't, wasn't very good on the island of Avain. Tycho was kind of a hardball. He uh, didn't treat people very well. So things began to surface and close in. And ultimately, that forced Tycho off of the highland of, of Havain. He packed up, took his data with him, and left in 1597. And basically his work was over. 
Now before publishing this, Elegy, Elegy to Dania, where he's basically chastising the country of Denmark for kicking him out. Denmark, what is my offense? How have I offended you, my fatherland? You may think that what I have done is wrong, but was I wrong to spread your fame abroad? Tell me, who has done such things before and sang, sung your honor to the very stars? So you can see here he's lamenting about his life's work essentially being over in the 20 years that he was on Uraniburg. Now, a couple years later, he moves to Prague in modern-day Czech land, and then two very significant things happen. 1599, he was appointed the imperial mathematicus, and he began to do work again for the, uh, the king. And in 1600, he hired a young German scientist and a brilliant theoretical mathematician named Johannes Kepler to basically be his protege. And he put Kepler in charge of the Mars data. So he and Kepler worked for a while, and Kepler began to get access to Tycho's 20 years worth of data. And the idea from the mind of, of Tycho was that Kepler's work would ultimately prove the validity of his, of his Tychonic system. So he was hoping that that would happen, but of course that took him down a very different path. Now in 1601 he attended a banquet, Tycho Brahe, where the emperor was present and um, he consumed a lot of beer. His health was already failing, but um, he began to drink quite a bit that night. And uh, when you drink a lot of beer, you know, there comes a point where you've got to get rid of that beer. The problem is, the protocol at the time was that you don't get up from the table until the emperor gets up and he decided not to get up. So throughout the course of the evening he had to go really, really bad, but he couldn't go and his bladder ruptured. And that resulted in a pretty brutal infection and 11 days later he died a gruesome, awful, and painful death. That kind of makes me cringe to even think about it, but I got to mention it in this presentation. On his deathbed he was quoted as saying, let me not seem to have lived in vain. It's a, by the way, it's a warning to any of you who are thinking of drinking too much. So. <laughs> That's my best attempt here to say, think before you drink. <laughs> he died prematurely. His data was passed on to Kepler. And he um, could not have imagined what the results would be. Kepler was born in Germany, and he was a staunch Copernican from the very start. He believed from the very beginning that Kepler was right in his heliocentric model of the universe. The sun was at the center, fixed and unmoving, and the planets go around the sun, including the Earth. And he was convinced also that the universe was governed by physical laws, underlying physical laws that govern the motions of the heavenly bodies. And in some ways, this parallels what we saw earlier with Pythagoras, the ancient Greek philosopher who um, believed in the harmony of the spheres, that the spheres were um, whole number ratios that um, when they rubbed against each other made music, like musical tones, in a very precise mathematical fashion. Well, what that was to Pythagoras is what Kepler believed the underlying laws of the universe were in terms of describing the motions of the heavenly bodies. And he was a brilliant mathematician, at, he was basically a brilliant theorist at analyzing data. In other words, he was the right man for the job at that time. He inherited Tycho's data. By the, by the way, his mother was uh, tried for witchcraft, and this is actually a footnote, part of Bill's presentation, but it's kind of an interesting story. She was tried for witchcraft and was um, scheduled to be tortured. Kepler tried to get her off the hook by basically convincing her that she, um, she should behave a certain way. And the custom at that time was when you're going to be tortured for witchcraft, you're taken down to the dungeon and you're shown all of these tools that are going to be used in your torture and the way in which those tools are going to be used to basically inflict torture upon you. And that usually convinced people to confess and then they would cave in. Well, Kepler's mother, when she saw all this, became extremely fascinated, almost to the point of being aroused when they started to show her the details of how these tools were going to be used. So they became, they became convinced that she was actually insane and then they let her go. So that's how she got off the hook for witchcraft. <laughs> anyway, just a little footnote there. He inherited Tycho's data, and he also inherited the imperial mathematicus position in 1601 to, uh, Emperor Rome, to the Emperor Rudolf II, as well as his two successors. 
So Kepler picked up where Tycho left off, his data and his position, and he analyzed the orbital data of Mars for four years in exquisite detail. And this is where the world changes. This was the watershed moment. He started by determining the orbit of the Earth by in, in successive oppositions of Mars to try and figure out the path of the orbit of the, of the Earth that it, it takes by looking at the, the Mars data. He tried to fit um, four data points on basically um, an equant, which is a circle off of a circle. And um, when he fit the four data points on this drawing right here of what was projected to be the orbit of Mars, they fit. But when he got to the fifth data point and he tried to fit that on the circle, it actually didn't fit. It was off by eight arc minutes. Now, he knew from working with Tycho Brahe that Brahe's precision was not more than one or two arc minutes. So this is the point where the world changes. So Kepler did something that had not been done for over 2,000 years. Instead of trying to fit the data to his preconceived notion, he took a step back and he analyzed the data again and tried to think, what is the data telling me? The data is telling him that the path that a planet takes, in this case Mars, around the sun is not a circle, but it's an ellipse. In some cases we're lucky because Mars has one of the most in terms of eccentricity, one of the most, um, I guess for lack of a better way of saying it, oval-shaped paths compared to, let's say, Venus or Jupiter. If Mars had the path that Venus had or Jupiter had, it would be virtually circular and there would not have been this much of a discrepancy and we may still be trying to figure this out. We'd be 500 years into the past. By taking a step back, Instead of a circle, he tried to fit it to an ellipse and ultimately published his three laws of planetary motion. Now, 2,000 years of history, Earth fixed and unmoving, complex system of gear works, epicycles, circles within circles, describing the motion of the heavenly bodies. When this moment occurred, Kepler threw all of this away. 2,500 years of history, gone in an instant. Wipes the slate clean and starts over with three simple laws of planetary motion, two of which were published in this book, the Astronomia Nova, in 1609. And basically the laws are this. The path that a planet takes when it orbits the sun is an ellipse with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. Planetary law, planetary law number one. Number two is that the area, if you draw a line from the planet to the, to the uh, focus of the ellipse, the area that it sweeps out over a period of time is equal. So when it's further away, it's, uh, the, 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 uh, the orbital path, the, the path that it takes is slower. When it gets closer, it's faster. So the area that you draw out is equal regardless of where it is. So this is the equal areas law. So why is the winter season shorter than the summer season? Because during the winter time, the Earth is actually slightly closer to the sun, so the gr sun's gravity is tugging on it, which means it's orbiting the sun faster than it is in the summertime when it's a little bit further away. That's why we see un seasons of unequal length, because of ultimately Kepler's second law, planetary motion. The third law is the most fascinating of all of them, and it wasn't published until later. But basically it means that the square of the period that the planet takes as it orbits the sun is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. So this gets into the harmonic law, the harmony of the spheres, that there's a precise mathematical relationship between the period and the semi-major axis of a planet. Here's what it looks like for the planets. You can see for Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter, if you take the the semi-major axis, which is basically the distance from the planet to the sun, in astronomical units, and you square it, and you compare it to the period, you come up with a precise, very precise ratio. Again, they're almost equal. So, and again, this more or less parallels the ideas of, of Pythagoras, 
back in the, um, in the 6th century BC, which is the harmony of the spheres. Kepler, from a mathematical pre uh, standpoint, ultimately tapped into the harmonic law, the harmonic laws of the universe, and that there's an underlying order, if you will, to the laws of planetary motion. Now, these are only empirical laws. They're observations. They describe what? They describe how the planets move, but they don't get to the, they don't, they don't, they don't, um, they describe how, but they don't describe why. They don't describe why they move that way. So in order to get there, you need to get the, you need to um, get a set of physical laws to understand why. Kepler got off to a good start here, but he didn't really understand, and he was inaccurate in his understanding, if you will, of, of the nature of forces that are causing these types of motions to, to behave. So he was motivated by the notions of physical harmonies and convinced that the motions could be understood physically. He understood that there had to be laws that governed these motions, but he didn't completely understand why and that would be left for the work of another man that would come along 70 years later, Isaac Newton. And that, of course, will be discussed when our next speaker is absent and I have to fill in again. <laughs> Thank you very much.